about three years ago uh, with then uh, Director of DAS, Jill Finnice, uh, and uh, the Bond Life Sciences Center. They were creating a really cool new program called Life Science Society Program, where they're encouraging the faculty. You're liking it. for us, we can't hear it. Thank you for letting me know. Hey, so the idea was for the Life Science Society program to create an international working group. Oftentimes at the university, we tend to be in our own silos. We sit in our own offices and uh, we're just kind of working on goals. But it was a good opportunity for people to start talking to each other, meeting each other, and hopefully collaborating with research. So we started a focus on Africa uh, angle to that. And we found lots of joy in meeting people who've never met each other but work in the same country. So we're continuing on with that same theme uh, and broadening it. So if your uh, research has anything to do in Africa or by Africans, about Africans, including diaspora, which is what we hear here today, uh, those are sort of our focus for that. Uh, today's program is sponsored by the NU Office of Research, uh, Kafka International Program, uh, directed by Dr. Schneeberger, uh, and our work as well. I want to take a quick moment to thank Yanu, our videographer in the back, doing incredible work. Uh, Jennifer as well, who helped us on the program, uh, as well as the entire team at CIP. We would not be remiss without thanking our interpreter. Uh, this is something new. We're starting this year. We want to make sure that our events are inclusive, uh, whether the videos are online or you're here in the room, to make sure that they are accessible to everyone who attend as well. All right, so today we are honored to have Professor Juana Maria Cordovis Cook uh, as a first 2019 program. She's a very busy woman, so we're very excited to have her here. Uh, professor Cordovis Cook is the Curator's Distinguished Research Professor and Catherine Payne Little Bush Professor of Foreign Language, and that in itself is an incredible feat. Uh, most of us have one of those, but she has two of those uh, as well. Uh, she has built her scholarship around four related and complementary pillars, gender studies, Afro-Latin American theater, Afro-Cuban Renaissance, and documentary filmmaking, which is the treat we're going to give you today. So her research focuses on the converg convergence of arts and letters and social concerns and how us always concentrated on the marginal, non canonical voices, uh, literature and culture of women and Afro-descendants, uh, essentially those who share an experience of oppression and oppression. So in addition to those two amazing feats, she has published over 80 journal articles, 14 books, and made over 23 films dealing with Afro-Cuban artists and writers. Her documentaries have received numerous national and international awards, including an Amy nomination, which is incredible. And they have, of course, been screened at hundreds um, of times across the world at really prestigious venues around the world. So today, Juana Moria is going to tell us about her work. Um, we're going to see some of the trailers, some of the films and documentaries she's put together as well. So please, give a warm welcome. Thank you very much, Nadesh. I'm very really delighted to be here with all of you, sharing some of my research about which I'm absolutely passionate. Um, uh, as Nadesh said, uh, I have been concentrated, uh, concentrating in the African diaspora in Latin America. And uh, through my research, and this has been over 25 years of research, I have realized that uh, it was in Cuba where the strongest development of intellectuals and artists of African descent had taken place in Latin America. Um, I don't know if, if you all know this, perhaps you do, but uh, um, of the uh, over 10 million Africans who were brought to the Americas as a slave, only 5% came to what is now the territory of the United States. The rest went to Latin America. So imagine um, the abundance that there is of people of African descent. And uh, the incredible fact that a little island like Cuba is where they have had the strongest development. Um, it, uh, uh, 
people would wonder why is this. Well, through the years, they have had intellectuals here and there who were really prominent with great work. However, it was after 1959, the revolution, that uh, where there was a tremendous uh, development of cultural institutions and opportunities uh, for the people in the margins that this development took place. It, uh, it is uh, something that uh, it is generation after generation. I happen to call this group uh, on generations of artists of African descent in Cuba, Havana's Black Renaissance, because it's very much like the Harlem Renaissance that was a few years uh, early, like three decades earlier, um, that came after tremendous and cataclysmic changes like uh, the uh, World War I, the immigration to the northern city, urbanization, that uh, all of the African Americans moved to the area of New York, many, I would say, and where they, you, there was a great development. Now the difference is that the Harlem Renaissance was about 10 to 12 years, and this in Cuba keeps happening, generation after generation. I have published quite a bit, and um, but um, uh, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, some trailers of um, some of the about my documentaries on these artists. Uh, the trailers I felt um, it could be a good way of giving you a little bit of the taste of uh, what I do. Uh, the first trailer is going to be on Rogelio Martinez Fure, who was born in 1936, and uh, he is perhaps at this point the greatest Africanist in Latin America. He has published uh, several books in translation of African poetry. In fact, his first book of poetry in translation um, that came in 1961 was sold out the day after it appeared in the public. Imagine. Um, but he also founded um, the folkloric, uh, the National Folkloric Ballet. Uh, he has dozens of books published, dictionaries. I mean, he's, a, he's an amazing person who unfortunately in the last year he has become completely blind. However, um, since uh, this generation of artists was not always welcomed by the government in Cuba, he went several years without publishing. So he still has stacks of manuscripts that are coming out because in a process of rectification of policies, um, and many of these people who were for a long time silenced, now they are being published and they are, they are really welcome into the cultural world. So we're going to start with uh, Rogelio Martinez. Would perhaps we can turn off a little bit the lights? What you will see is the folkloric ballet starting. <laughs> No hay nada global que no tenga una identidad propia. Y eso en la obra de Rogelio Martínez Fulé está muy marcado por su africaniña, por, quizás por su afrocentrismo, que es algo que muchos criticamos en los grandes estudiosos de África. Pero aquí el afrocentrismo de Rogelio Martínez Fulé es la esencia de su propia obra personal. Yo tengo una visión idealizada, romántica, de mis orígenes, pero sí una asunción eternamente simátrona. Dije, voy a refugiarme, voy a zambullirme en la fuente profunda de la sabiduría oral. Yo me le tape a Mónica como si fuera un sinsonte. En 1982 creé Los Sábados de la Zumba, un espacio donde iba el pueblo y donde cada semana yo los retaba a que me trajeran testimonios de su vivencia de que eran creadores de cultura y no simples consumidores de cultura. Nos falta 
mucho por hacer pero hemos contribuido un poquito a devolver la memoria y el olvido a nuestro pueblo Well, um, I don't know if you noticed that uh, at the beginning, uh, Rogelio Martinez who just started um, singing in, in uh, Yoruba language. And uh, this is a very interesting detail, the fact that uh, in Cuba they have kept the Yoruba language uh, from about three centuries ago. In fact, uh, I was doing research on a play written by Eugenio, Eugenio Hernández Espinosa, and uh, it had a lot of parts with this Yoruba language. So I, I finally found here in Colombia a woman from Nigeria. So I went to see her to see if she could help me translate that. And she said, I really don't understand that language. So uh, doing research, I found um, that um, uh, Wun Soyinka, the Nobel Prize of Literature, who has been in Cuba a few times, the first time he went to Cuba, absolutely marveled because he realized that um, the language they were speaking was the very old Yoruba that was not spoken anymore in Nigeria. And I'm telling you this because it's very interesting how in Cuba they have been able to keep the traditional and also spiritual traditions that perhaps in Africa you don't find as much. Okay, and so uh, you're going to see in different uh, in, in different fragments some of these traditions with religion. Let's see the next one. It is um, which one? Oh, Eduardo. What you're going to see is um, the trailer on Eduardo Rivero, who was um, a great dancer who brought um, the African influence to Cuban modern dance. plasticidad muy especial, tenía un concepto de la dinámica muy bello y sus obras coreográficas que han devenido clásicos de nuestra cultura, de la fusión de lo negro con lo técnico, con lo popular. Cualquier obra que yo hago, lo hago después de un amplio proceso de estudio. Era un gusto verlo eh, manifestarse, porque era un hombre, hermano, confesó que quería mover las estatuas. Y yo creo que lo logró. A mí me fascina Santiago. Por lo, todo lo que es Santiago, por la belleza, por el sol, por la fuerza que tiene la gente. Ya yo pienso como Santiaguero. Oh, doqui, 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 oh, moro, moro y na. Doki doki pomoro moro yena. Hoy tuve el honor de ser uno de los tres bailarines que él escogió para su obra, que pienso que está dentro de, de sus obras maestras, Zulkari, la cual bailé durante muchos años prácticamente alrededor del mundo. Él era capaz de captar el, el talento a veces en la calle. Yo recuerdo que él llegó a ser el primer bailarín de primera figura, una muchacha que era jardinero. Y a mí a agua, a huyu y maya, yo ni huibiludu. Well, something, something that I would like to, uh, to share with you is the fact that as much as the Cuban Revolution gave this amazing, gave this amazing opportunities, education and in the arts and all the world of culture, they were never able to control the racial issues. 
there is a still racism in Cuba. And this man, Eduardo Rivero, he, he was in Havana dancing and taking classes. And then he wanted to, to work with his group, practicing regularly. Well, he, they, they were giving him half an hour once a month. And so when he realized that, he moved to Santiago de Cuba, where uh, there is tremendous cultural life, but still it's not the capital. And then he was able to work there. So this is just uh, um, not, to, not to allow the misunderstanding that there is no racial issues there. Yes, they are a big time. We can talk more about it. OK. OK. Um, we are going to see now the, uh, the longest of all the trailers, which is on Nancy Morejon. Nancy, Nancy Morejon is uh, uh, a wonderful friend of Columbia, Missouri, and the university. We have brought her many, many times since 1993. Um, she really is uh, perhaps the most prominent and celebrated Afro Afro-Latin um, American writer and poet, okay? Um, she, her name really is going around for the highest awards and recognitions in the world. So I hope that you enjoy this. importante poeta afrodescendiente de lengua española contemporánea. Nancy marca realmente un momento tan importante como puede haber sido de lengua la Todos los homenajes que ha recibido a nivel nacional e internacional son más que merecidos. Porque su poesía ha sabido escoger de ella lo primordial, aquello que trasciende, aquello que, que puede conmover a cualquier ser humano, esté donde esté. Y ya modupe Aquí está mi yo, está mi historia. Yo no hubiera podido escribir todo lo que he escrito si yo creo que no, no hubiera estado aquí. no puedo recordarla ni el mismo océano podría recordarla pero no olvido el primer alcatraz que dice altas las nubes como inocentes testigos presenciales acaso no he olvidado ni mi costa perdida ni mi lengua ancestral me dejaron aquí y aquí he vivido y porque trabajé como una bestia, aquí volví a nacer. ¿A cuánta epopeya mandinga intenté recurrir? Me rebelé. Su merced me compró en una plaza. Bordé la casaca de su merced y un hijo macho le parí. Mi hijo no tuvo nombre y su merced murió a manos de un impecable lord inglés. Anduve. Esta es la tierra donde padecí boca abajo y azotes. Bogué a lo largo de todos sus ríos. Bajo su sol sembré, recolecté y las cosechas no comí. Por casa tuve un barracón. Yo misma traje piedras para edificarlo, pero canté al natural compás de los pájaros nacionales. Me sublevé. En esta misma tierra toqué la sangre húmeda y los huesos podridos de muchos otros, traídos a ella o no, igual que yo. Yo nunca más imaginé el camino a Guinea. 
era a Guinea, a Benín, era a Madagascar o a Cabo Verde. Trabajé mucho más. Fundé mejor mi canto milenario y mi esperanza. Aquí construí mi mundo. Me fui al monte. Mi real independencia fue el palenque y cabalgué entre las tropas de Maceo. Solo un siglo más tarde, junto a mis descendientes, desde una azul montaña, bajé de la sierra para acabar con capitales y usureros, con generales y burgueses. Ahora soy, solo hoy tenemos y creamos. Nada nos es ajeno. Nuestra la tierra, nuestros el mar y el cielo, nuestras la magia y la quimera. Iguales míos, aquí los veo bailar alrededor del árbol que plantamos para el comunismo. Su pródiga madera ya resuena. desde el principio partiendo de ella, de sí misma, de su contexto, de su realidad, pero tratando de profundizar en ellos para alcanzar una universalidad. ¿Hasta dónde va a poder llegar con ese talento, con esa inspiración, con ese amor a lo que le rodea, con esa lucidez, esa percepción que ella tiene de los sitios, de los personajes, de, de, de la historia propia nuestra? Son eh, temas que no se habían tratado antes de esta manera, o que no se habían tratado algunos ni siquiera, y mucho más visto desde la, de la, desde la óptica de una mujer negra. A partir de 59 es que surge la primera gran generación de escritores afrodescendientes que desde adentro tratan de llevar a la literatura nuestra ese aspecto que era como el lado oculto de la luna, sin autoexotismo. Y Nancy es uno de esos ejemplos. Ahí está su poema eh, acerca de la familia, de su madre, de su abuela, de su padre. Esa cosmovisión de la cubanía profunda es uno de los grandes aportes que ha hecho Nancy, en primer lugar como mujer, como poeta, como mujer negra de origen popular, que ha entrado no con mucha facilidad, pero ha logrado violentar las puertas de esos arcanos tan selectivos de la literatura escrita en nuestros países de América. Mi madre no tuvo jardín, sino islas acantiladas flotando bajo el sol en sus corales delicados. No hubo una rama limpia en su pupila, sino muchos jarrotes. Qué tiempo aquel cuando corría descalza sobre la cal de los orfelinatos y no sabía reír, y no podía siquiera mirar el horizonte. Ella no tuvo el aposento de marfil, ni la sala de mimbre, ni el vitral silencioso del trópico. Mi madre vio el pañuelo para acunar la fe de mis entrañas, para alzar su cabeza de reina de su vida, y dejarnos sus manos como piedra. Uh, a god from the African Olympus, really. Um, and uh, what he creates is all of his vision of his spirituality. Let's go ahead. En las afueras de La Habana, o en lo alto de esos remotos pueblos capitalinos, cuyo paisaje se extravía perdido en los recovecos de una memoria, las casas donde habita Manuel Mendive han sido siempre parte esencial de ese mundo encantado que es el de su pintura. His world is a, is a tropical paradise, really. Cuando algo no tengo color, no tengo forma, no hay movimiento, pero simplemente trato de decir las cosas que sueño, las cosas que sueñan los demás. Y todas las cosas hermosas que nos rodean en este gran escenario que es la naturaleza. 
yo trato siempre de que todo sea más hermoso embellecer la vida es mi gran objetivo cuando estoy pintando soy tan sincero quizás hablando a una conversación puede ocultarle algo seguro quizás no le digo lo que deseo pero cuando estoy pintando sí tengo que decirlo todo porque soy muy sincero y es la única forma que tengo para decir todo lo que siento Espero que todo el mundo lo comprenda. This perhaps is a little bit short to give you the whole flavor of his work, but he does uh, painting, um, soft sculpture, wood sculpture. Uh, metal sculpture, he does uh, a lot of performances and the one that you saw we filmed, it was amazing during the biennial in Havana and uh, he went to this incredible building which is the great theater in Havana, a uh, neo-baroque building and so that was invaded by all kinds of artists, dancers and he painted their body, he does a body painting and then they went walking um, into the streets and uh, uh, you saw some, like, there were circus people really who were just, uh, I don't know how you say, by throwing fire through their mouth and it was that way because people would just crowd around him that they would open for, so he could walk, okay? This man um, is uh, missing one foot because he lost a foot uh, in, um, in an accident when he was about 15 or 16 and uh, he always tells that when he lost that food and we saw all the blood uh, coming out of his food is when he changed his feeling about the colors he was going to use in his art which I think is pretty interesting but he's a very sweet man also it's a pleasure to to work with him we are going to see now the trailer on the documentary on Choco. Choco is an artist uh, whose work we brought here two years ago again in the same big event of Afro-Cuban artists. And uh, he's a colographer, which is uh, a kind of engraving, I don't know if you're familiar with that, um, that um, actually started coming at the end of the 20th century and with lack of resources they would use all kind of bricolage material they would find in the streets to give different textures. And so his, uh, his colographs have wonderful, wonderful uh, texture of all matters, all kinds. It can be from the piece of a chair to perhaps an old plastic uh, um, tablecloth. It doesn't matter, but they, at the end, they are beautiful. Let's go ahead. He's very inspired by music. the Parece ser que yo tengo un conocimiento tremendo de esto, 
pues no. policies of the revolution did for people from very humble background. He comes from a family of, I think, 11 children. Um, the father died very young, the mother was very poor, and he was from Santiago de Cuba, in the orient of the island. And uh, he says that uh, when he was about uh, 12 or 13, he realized he loved art, and so the revolution gave him the opportunity of going to Havana to study and to take all the courses with all the different art institutes who, that were absolutely amazing to become the great artist he is. He also uh, shares a very interesting experience. Um, uh, you know, he, you know, Cuba was very involved in Angola, so he decided to go to Angola, um, and. Um, he says that uh, he, he felt like Gary, that going to Angola, he was going to find his real soul, that that was his place. Well, it happened like a lot of people, of African Americans who go to Africa with that idea. He realized that, no, he wasn't African. That's why I kind of rebelled about calling African American. Okay, but anyhow, that's another issue. Um, but uh, he, he says he realized, really, something that uh, Franz Fanon realized at, at one point too, that uh, once the Africans came here, they just couldn't control the process of hybridity, of transculturation, of, uh, of being influenced, and at the same time influencing the culture where they were immersed. And uh, so I, uh, I found that uh, extremely fascinating. Um, and I think that that in many ways has been assimilated by a lot of these great uh, intellectuals that uh, we, I have been studying. Um, now you're going to see a documentary on another artist we brought two years ago, uh, Rodriguez Olazabal. Um, his uh, great grandmother was an African slave. And he is a priest of a branch of Santeria, which is the Regla de Ifa. And uh, he is a very serious priest, really. And at one point, and I think that uh, we show it here, he went uh, into a trance that he, when we were filming him, and we left that in the film. I think we, we included that in the trailer, which I think is, uh, is very interesting. That man also, Everything he does in his artwork is symbolic of his spirituality. Absolutely everything, and it can be very cryptic. And this is the reason why we did a little documentary on him where we had a guided tour of his exhibit. But let's see first this. en el modo en que tuvieron mis ancestros de concebir la vida y el mundo, en sus conceptos filosóficos, en su, en su modo de, de hacer la religión, de hacer determinados ritos y de conocer las esencias de esa ceremonia y de esos ritos. That was the trans moment. 
yo no me considero un artista yo me considero un hacedor de objetos eso es lo que, lo que yo me considero y es lo que soy un hacedor de objetos ¿qué cosa es un santero sino un hacedor de objetos? eso es lo que soy yo Now we're going to see a, a brief version, really, of um, the guided tour that we had here. We can do the next one. Nadesh. Shoot seven. <coughs> that one. Yeah. That was at the big hand gallery. Este es un conjunto de obras que eh, resume en realidad el, 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 el sentido de la palabra agua, que agua significa secreto, que es eh, 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 algo primordial eh, para nosotros los que practicamos esta religión. Dice, todos los seres humanos eh, buscamos una posición privilegiada pero que esa posición privilegiada no excluye o que seamos ignorantes o que tengamos sabiduría o que seamos eh, muy, muy avaros o que seamos muy egoístas o que seamos muy amorosos esta es una obra que yo dedico o sea, es un homenaje eh, a mi bisabuela a mi abuela y a mi madre fueron y son muy importantes para mí dos de ellas fueron yalochas madres de santo la palabra yorubá para, para, para denominar a las, a las madrinas, a las llamadas madrinas de, la, madrina de la santería cubana o a las madres de santo. En realidad es un conjunto eh, y habla sobre, sobre el, el camino que, que, que conduce al, al hombre a, a, a la consagración de Ifá. Las piedras son más, muy importantes para nosotros porque eh, son los receptáculos donde eh, eh, vive la espiritualidad de las deidades, de los orishas. Hay una piedra sagrada, hay un Odun Difá, Babay de Temei, que habla de esa piedra sagrada, que es la piedra que trajo Ochun, la diosa del amor, la madre de todos los hijos de la tierra, de Anaonu, o sea, de otra dimensión a nuestro mundo, a nuestra realidad. screening of, of, of my trailers with a, a trailer on Roberto Surbano. Um, I will give you a little uh, very brief uh, view on who he is. Uh, in my understanding, Roberto Surbano is uh, perhaps uh, the sharpest and uh, uh, a scholar on racial issues in Cuba. Um, and uh, he is very honest and he's very well known. In 2013, he was giving a tour of talks. In fact, we, we brought him here about three years ago, two or three years ago. Um, and uh, the New York Times asked him to write uh, an article on racism in Cuba. So he wrote an article, but it wasn't really, I would say, horribly critical, but he's an honest person. So he was brief and he actually, he has said uh, much stronger things at other occasions, even in Cuba. Um, and uh, he had the position as the editor, the head editor of the press for Casa de las Americas, which is like the cultural center, no, epicenter not only for Cuba, but for all Latin America. Uh, when he returned to Cuba, oh, but the thing that the New York Times did when they translated the article without telling him, they changed the subject, the, the, or the title, the translation. And so he said the original title was something, and now what will have to my, what will be happening to my black people? And the New York Times translated as saying, 
the revolution hasn't started hasn't started for black people. So when he returned to Cuba, it was terrible. They demoted him. Uh, they have tried to to really, um, how can I tell you, not to bring him to, to anything that uh, shows how brilliant he is, really. Um, it has been uh, very, very hard. Uh, in fact, um, this is the first time that I'm showing in public something of what I have done on him. The documentary I have on him is an amazing testimonial, which I'm not able to show yet. But uh, I, uh, I want to share this with you, so you have a little bit of a view of who he is. His name is Roberto Zumba. Here he comes. además su trabajo de cenizar azucarero le limpiaba zapatos en el pueblo yo mmm, veía eso con cierta naturalidad porque tenía otros amigos que sus padres también eran limpiabotas pero en realidad el oficio de limpiabotas es un oficio que tiene que ver con la pobreza porque se dice en la revolución había mucha oportunidad para los negros es cierto pero ellos estaban preparados para eso. No. Cuando publiqué mi artículo en New York Times, hubo una construcción de un urbano contrarrevolucionario, opositor, mal agradecido a la revolución. Yo creo que hay que tener una agenda política para luchar contra el racismo. Y parece ser que la intención del gobierno y las instituciones públicas en Cuba es luchar contra el racismo. La intención. Falta la estrategia. Se trata de cómo escribir las armas, cómo entregarlas responsablemente a nuestros hijos, pasarlas, que crezcan preparados para nuevos tiempos. ¿Por qué? Ok, this is it. Thank you for coming. If you have any question, I'll be happy to answer. How did you get started on this? It, I would say it's part of an organic intellectual development. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I started um, doing research on, on the African diaspora. I started by, first of all, by a book on Afro-Uruguayan theater. When I discovered that there had been Afro-Uruguayan theater and it wasn't in any book on Latin American theater. So I published what turned out to be the first book on Afro-Hispanic theater. And then in 1993, I met here in Colombia Nancy Morejon, the poet that uh, you saw in the, on the screen. And, uh, and then I, I, she started putting me in touch with all of this intelligentsia. Um, she actually, she, when we met, she asked me to work on her poetry. And I had only read one poem. But I had just finished the PhD, and I said yes. And I will never regret that, yes, really. And, um, and so um, in, what was that? In 2001, I was invited um, by Casa de las Americas, that intellectual hub in Havana, to attend a, a great celebration of an Argentine writer whom I had written a lot. And uh, so I went, and Nancy Morejon started introducing me to these people. And so I just thought, this is amazing. And I started going. I kept being invited, and I kept going and going. And then one day I thought, I need to start at the University of Missouri a special collection of Afro-Romance culture and, and literature, which is now in the Museum of Anthropology. And we called it Nancy Morricone because she had, she had been opened the doors to that world. And, um, and so doing research, I thought, it's kind of a special collection. They, they film a lot of oral histories. Why don't I film oral histories? So I found, I don't know how, um, a young woman who was finishing her PhD here uh, who had done filming oral histories for the Smithsonian. So she came with me, and as I was doing that, I stood in front of the scene, I thought, I should be doing documentaries. I have absolutely no background in that. I mean, that was an act of audacity. <laughs> and, uh, and so I started looking for a team. 
And here I couldn't find uh, the, the different people who could have done it. Uh, I just didn't feel comfortable. And I was able to identify an amazing group, one by one, in Havana. And that's how I started. And it has been all, I would say, an intellectual and artistic intuition of doing this. And it has been, for me, the most exciting experience I could have, really. I love it. <laughs> Thank you. That's true. Other questions? Yes. How is this kind of study received in Africa? In Africa, I have not taken it there, but <laughs> some people from Africa who have seen my films have asked me to go, and we have a colleague here from Cameroon who has invited me to go and show a few of my films there, but I understand that now Cameroon is not too safe. So, my husband has kind of hinted <laughs> that I should, <laughs> although he says it's your decision, but I think, uh, I think I'm going to wait. Uh, in, in fact, I met um, someone from South Africa who has a foundation there, who asked me also to, to try to, to go and show some of my films there. Particularly because when you start looking at this, you realize that the old Africa is still living in this world, you know. And uh, I find that absolutely fascinating. Other questions? Yes. Didn't you do a True False Film Festival on your documentary sometime? Yeah, I would, I would love it. In fact, in San Francisco, there was a little festival of my documentaries. In Havana, there has been. Uh, there is a woman who has a wonderful cultural center in New York who has asked me. And I would be happy to do it because uh, I think that it gives such an amazing view of that world, you know, and at the same time, the thing is to keep in mind these people are having a hard time yet, okay, but when you think, one of the poets I have really worked a lot on, she, when the revolution succeeded, she was a cook. And, I mean, she's still very, very poor, but she has become an amazing poet I did a bilingual anthology we published about two, three years ago that won the first one, the number one award in the world as an um, anthology on bilingual um, edition. Um, and uh, you find these kind of people, like you saw Choco, you know, he came from the, mo the poorest background. And I mean, and these, these people are incredible. There is a soul there, you know that is responding to this. And actually, um, and many people have want me to do documentaries, and I have, been, uh, I have been careful, very careful in choosing the subjects of my documentaries, um, because what I want is to find people who really do uh, exceptional work in many ways, in some aspects, and high quality work of a deep uh, intelligentsia. But I, I also want them to, to, to represent, uh, you know, something important from the world. And so far, that's what I, what I have been trying to do. But I had a documentary here I did on Elliot Battle that won several awards, and now we're trying to complete one on Michael Middleton, which is coming out, uh, coming along well. It will, be, it will be to be a screen here, I think, sometime in September. Are yes. These, are these people somewhat isolated from the Spanish influence from the Cubans, or how do they retain this through education? Or um, it is uh, through oral um, oral communication. You know, um, they are not isolated by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I think um, interracial relations are very different uh, in Cuba from here. Very, very different. And even the, the sense of identity in the United States is genetic. One drop of African black, that person is African American. But uh, in Latin America, it's really phenotypical. The person loses the trait, it's what? Yes, thank you. I, that's, I, I, that's what fascinates me. I went to Cuba, as you know because my wife wanted to go to Cuba. And I said, eh, you know. And uh, I loved this experience. And one of the things that I think is most striking is just the body language of mm -hmm. persons of African 
background in Cuba, uh, particularly older people. I think younger people here are more comfortable. But uh, that kind of, I don't know, the thing that, uh, what's his name, Ralph Ellison and some of the American writers talked about, the kind of invisible barriers, it doesn't seem as, no. as no. intense there at all. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's very, very different. I, um, I feel very, very comfortable there. But um, I think uh, that this kind of work is very welcome in Cuba. Very fortunate. Well, thank you so much today for coming. We so appreciate the hard work and we so appreciate having you at our university. Uh, so do come back. We have our next presentation. We're going to keep having them all semester long. Uh, we have Tina Bloom, who's incredible. She has started a program that takes the students in the School of Nursing to Ghana. So a lot of this experiential learning we're trying to do. Um, we have a scholar, uh, Ravina, a doctoral student as well, who's going to present. Uh, and then in April, we'll have a professor coming from KU. And then, um, I'm not sure if you, many of you have heard of this, but uh, at the University of Missouri, we have a really great relationship with UWC, uh, and we have a whole partnership with faculty members are encouraged to partner with their counterparts at UWC. So Brian and Michelle will come talk about their project and what they're really yeah. working on as well. So that at the end of the semester, we should have a great direct of what is happening on our campus in regards to um, activism. So, thank you so much for coming today. Uh, we do have some snacks and food in the back. Uh, you also have copies of our quick survey. We would love to have your input. It is really helpful to us uh, as we get financial support, but to hear from you about what changes to do. So, uh, many thanks. Uh, so, have a great day and please stay warm. <laughs> well, thank you.